Good morning, everybody. <laughs> I lost my voice a couple of days ago, so it's, it's recovering. I'll have to go to the deep basement, perhaps, to get through the sermon. <laughs> if I had to choose my favorite holiday, I think I would choose Thanksgiving. It is a coming together to express our appreciation and gratitude for kith and kin and all God's blessings. It is a way of coming home. And here is the gist of my sermon. When you have faith, an authentic, sacred, and sincere faith, you have a home, what you might call a forever home. Faith is said to be a gift, and if we are so favored, it is worth our joyous gratitude on Thanksgiving Day and every day. In my thoughts this morning are seeped in the Christian faith tradition, and they lead to a special Thanksgiving Day memory. In this tradition, silver bells toll, and love is found in the splendors and miseries of the world. Arthur Kessler, the author of Darkness at Noon, says this about faith. A faith is not acquired by reasoning. One doesn't fall in love or enter the womb of a church as a result of logical persuasion. Reason may defend an act of faith, but only after the act has been committed and the man or woman committed to the act. Persuasion may play a part in conversion, but only the part of bringing to its full and conscious climax a process which has been maturing in regions where no persuasion can penetrate. A faith is not acquired. It grows like a tree. Its crown points to the sky. Its roots grow downward into the past and are nourished by the dark sap of the ancestral humus. With that in mind, allow me to return to a moment nearly 40 years ago when I was helping admit a little old man into the nursing home where I was a caregiver. A social worker had informed me Padraig, for that was his name, Padraig, was for all intents and purposes alone in the world. His wife, Evelyn, had died of a particularly virulent form of cancer. Paddy, P-A-D-D-Y, as he preferred to be called, was her devoted caregiver throughout. They were a childless couple. He was a carpenter, an only child from a poor family, and had dropped out of school to help his parents, who later were killed in a traffic accident when he was barely 16. Considered an oddity, passed along from relative to uncaring relative and a church orphanage, Patty had been mocked and bullied for his earnest and early religious beliefs. He was a hungry reader. Most notably, however, he was persistently helping others even those who castigated him. What's more, as I was to find out, Patty, this small-statured leprechaun of a man, was the most kindly, most gentle of men. Unfortunately, he was struggling with a slow, steady, progressive dementia. Shortly after Evelyn's death, he several times had been unable to find his home. Upon obtaining Patty's vitals, height and weight, we chatted a bit. Truth be told, I was not in a serene mood that day. <laughs> in fact, I was frazzled. Prior to Patty's arrival, I had been showing a young and giggly female trainee around when I decided to introduce her to Bessie, a retired English teacher and one of our dearest residents. Bessie, her well-thumbed Bible near at hand, motioned me over and said she wanted to whisper something in my ear. I leaned forward, whereupon she grabbed her ice water pitcher and threw its contents in my face. <laughs> As I stood there, stunned, baffled, and dripping, <laughs> my trainee laughing her head off, Bessie yelling, Satan's goon, repent. <laughs> 
I concluded my day had reached its nadir. <laughs> Patty noticed my discomfiture and my moistness. <laughs> what happened, he asked. After I related my aquatic adventure, Patty said, well, now that you've been properly baptized, I think you're ready for the great discovery. What's that, I asked. Trouble, he replied. Trouble is not an interruption in the normal course of life. Trouble is life. <laughs> he went on to say, Teresa of Avila once informed God that the reason he had so few friends <laughs> was that he treated those he did have so badly. <laughs> Patty adored Teresa of Avila. The Spanish mystic somehow reminded him of Evelyn. While charmed, I feared a daily sermon would be my lot, and those pamphlets with three-step instructions on how to stay out of hell. <laughs> but I was wrong. Patty never bothered me, probably because he was too busy laboring in the vineyards, helping his new neighbors. He had a routine, up early, self-care, decked in a suit and hand-tied bow tie, Patty would help us take confused residents to the dining room or see that they got to occupational therapy, physical therapy, arts and crafts, religious services, and entertainments. Often he would just stop to sit and laugh with people. How he loved to laugh. After meals, he would meander to the front door and heartily greet visitors. Indeed, first-time visitors assumed he was one of the brighter members of our administration. <laughs> Oscar Wilde once said, those whom the gods love grow young. He must have had Patty in mind. What zest this 89-year-old man had I must add, he always carried a deck of cards with him in order to play Crazy Eights, his favorite of all games. I asked him how he remained so cheerful, held his inner peace. My faith, he answered. We are in God's hands. But you see, <clears throat> most people do not listen to God. Their egos get in the way. That's when people are not themselves, not the way God wants them to be. When they do finally listen, they return to their true selves like prodigal sons and daughters. They regain their joy and share it with others. He reminded me Teresa of Avila detested sour saints. <laughs> Quintessential irony, it was I who beseeched him for help. Louise, another new resident suffering with dementia, a woman who could never be mistaken for Miss Congeniality <laughs> was put on my resident list. My assignment, number one, wake her at six in the morning. Number two, help her wash and dress. Number three, formally invite her to breakfast. I counted three strikes against me before I knocked on her door. <laughs> to be succinct, my encounter with Louise was acrimonious. <laughs> During her expletive Latin tirade, she made an extraordinary suggestion as to what I could do with my invitation. <laughs> Namely, a physical feat which, even if it were possible, would be deemed socially inappropriate. <laughs> Your situation is hopeless, but not impossible, Patty joked. Ever the practical optimist, he got down to brass tacks. Tell Louise her sister Anna wants to have breakfast with her. She hasn't seen Anna in years, and it really bothers her. Once Louise is out of her room, she'll forget everything. <laughs> Such is her plight. But serve her first and watch her blossom. Incredibly, it worked just as Patty said it would. Thanks to our chicanery, Louise had some enjoyable breakfast. Best of all, she grew to trust me and expected me to be around. 
More good news. The water bearer, Bessie, and I became friends again. A nurse had given her an improper dose of a psychotropic drug. Yeah. <laughs> but it took over a week before she was herself again. Most disturbing, Bessie focused her holy wrath only on me. <laughs> I was the seed of Cain. I was anathema. <laughs> only me. Upon seeing me walk by her room, she would invariably aim her ample crucifix in my direction and yell, Satan, be gone! <laughs> Curious mixed metaphors issued from her lips, among my favorites, pox on humanity and cloven-hoofed satyr. In short, I was not the harp of the Holy Spirit in Bessie's eyes. Yet again, Patty provided me with aid and comfort, assuring me and reassuring me, this too shall pass. And so it did. Looking back on those days, I do not recall thinking much about religion. After all, it was the 1970s, and your Georgie Porgy had gone out to play. <laughs> Alas, my mind was on Babylon and not Jerusalem. Maybe Bessie picked up on that contagion. <laughs> Months later, when I was transporting Patty to what proved to be his final doctor's appointment, I remember asking him, half seriously, for the secret of happiness. Crazy eights, he quipped, <laughs> referring to his favorite card game, which was now legendary and boisterous and played at the drop of a hat. Everyone was invited. The secret of happiness is so simple, he said, but people make it so difficult. The secret of happiness is giving. Giving is living. Once you are on the giving path, you dwell in the eternal. Life becomes vibrant, interesting. You never tire of helping others. Now, don't make of giving an insatiable monster. God wants us to be good, not exhausted. <laughs> you don't need a lot of money. Follow the example of Jesus. Give someone some of your time or your energy or your ideas. Give appreciation, understanding, encouragement. Give joy. Give healing. Don't worry you're not good enough to help others. God knows what wretches we are. He gave us the Garden of Eden, and we turned it into a parking lot. And never forget, when our Savior needed his disciples the most, one betrayed him, one denied him, and the rest ran away. Giving is the rose-petaled path to the heart of God. Where was the dementia? Patty had been with us for several months. It was November, his late wife Evelyn's birthday month, he told us. My fingers were crossed. Maybe a miracle had occurred, and he would be spared. Hope forlorn. It was not to be. Not too long after his doctor appointment, he came to me fretting. He was lost. He really didn't know where he was. Patty died <clears throat> deep in the night of Thanksgiving. When I entered his ward the next morning, they had already taken him away. His mattress was scrubbed and flipped, ready for the next occupant. His closet, too, was clean and empty. No evidence he ever existed. But then, by sheer chance, I noticed something behind the lamp on his newly cleaned nightstand. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> something which had escaped the housekeeper's duties. His deck of cards. <laughs> so it was, <clears throat> so it was to be. Thanksgiving Day, when we day shifters last saw Patty alive. <clears throat> Holidays, holy days, Easter, Thanksgiving, and Christmas always took many residents with them. They went home 
in all senses of the word. By Thanksgiving Day, Patty had hardly left his room. His decline had been rapid. I invited him to a lounge, there to enjoy one of the great meals of the year, and thereby to thank God for all our blessings. That clinched it. I helped him get around. <clears throat> he was so gaunt, so lost. By way of wheelchair, I escorted him to the promised land of the elderly, a warm and cozy lounge. Many residents had left with friends and family. Seven of those left behind were in my charge. The fragrance of turkey and all the trimmings was in the air, along with that of cinnamon and pumpkin pie. Bessie thanked me for bringing him. Yes, Bessie. Patty nodded and waved to all assembled and wanted to sit by the window, which looked out on a vast empty field. Of course, as they ate, these frail pilgrims talked and shared memories, memories of the days when they were young, of huge family dinners and journeys, sometimes by sleigh, to visit Grandma's home. Then, staring out the window, Louise gasped, it's snowing. Indeed it was in large flakes too, and with the cloudy day, a blue haze covered everything. So much so, it seemed early evening rather than mid-afternoon. Soon after Louise's observation, Anna, yes, Anna, Louise's sister, made another discovery at the far end of the field, a Christmas tree dressed in blue lights. Oh, where are the children, Bessie lamented. They so love to catch the snowflakes. At Patty's request, we sang Silent Night. He told us, recently, every night, he dreamed of Evelyn. She was waiting for him beyond a meadow. And they were going to go sledding <clears throat> with others under a holiday moon. We lingered there in the lounge for a long time, not wanting to leave, watching the quiet beauty of the snow falling and the lonely Christmas tree.